Hey everybody, welcome to my painting from the master's class and um, this first two week session I've picked Edgar Payne. So I'm sure you've heard of Edgar Payne. <laughs> um, this was actually one of the first books I, I bought starting at the school uh, over 20 years ago and it's still one of my favorites for um, composition. Um, the things I like about Edgar Payne's work, well, there's a lot of things I like about his work. Um, but the thing I'm probably first attracted to is his color palette. Um, I would put him in the category of being uh, among the color, um, the California Impressionists. And that was uh, a group of people who I kind of fell in love with before I even started at the school. Um, I've always been drawn to colorful paintings. Um, and I really like the California Impressionists because it's, you know, where I'm from. And so the, the scenes are, they have a familiarity to them. Whereas, you know, when you look at like just the Impressionists, usually you think of Monet and, you know, France and England and places like that. And so they have a, a bit of a foreign um, topography to them, to my eye. And so with the California Impressionists, they tended to paint a lot of the West Coast and um, the Southwest, which I really love. And the Southwest has its own sort of unique light that um, a lot of other people around the world talk about. And so artists will come to the Southwest, you know, like Utah and New Mexico and those places to capture that light because it has a certain look. Whereas when you look at um, like the light in New England, you know, or on the East Coast, it has a different quality or different temperature most of the time to it. So that's probably why it kind of fit what the California Impressionists did. Um, so with Edgar Payne, he um, painted pretty wide variety of landscape subjects, um, sometimes with small little figures in there. And so let me get to the color plates here just to kind of show you. Like here's some like little beach scenes. So you can kind of see coastal and, and boats. He painted a lot of boats. You know, obviously that's on the front cover. Um, and he has a whole little section on how to plan composition for boats. He has some color sections on how he does um, uh, his color palettes, like how to, to go about um, going through ideas for, for putting your painting into a different color field. Um, so he talks a lot about color complements. So that's another thing I like about his work. He's pretty simple uh, in terms of how he presents color. Um, this book's not really a color painting book. He has a very brief um, bit on that. Um, and he more encourages you to go and kind of go observe color and um, try out color and keep your palette simplified. Um, so he's not really, it's not really about how to paint book. It's more about composition. And then here's some, some other scenes here. Some of them are gouache, some are kind of um, primitive. And then there's a few things in here from his daughter and his wife, um, they also painted. So when you see a different style in the book, don't be alarmed, that's not from Edgar Payne. His is pretty identifiable. Um, he's got great shape design. And so he's someone you wanna look at when you're trying to figure out how to, to simplify something down into um, better forms. Um, I like, I love his tree, his tree designs. Um, and then there's a little, little bit of instruction on how he goes about the process to start his paintings and what, what he does for that. Cause that's a little bit different than some people. Um, but here, here's some more that are more, a uh, little bit more finished pieces. And some of his paintings are very complicated in terms of just size and scale of what he's painting. And then some are very, very simple. Like my demo is a very, pretty simple image. It's mostly a cloud piece. Um, but he has just these beautiful mountain scenes. And you'll see a lot of people now painting the similar scenes in his style because it's just very, um, I don't know, it's just, it's just a beautiful way to break down uh, that, the landscape. So here's more in here. And lots of like Canyon de Chez and places like that. Um, his figuratives are not as much my favorite. Um, they're, they're very simple, sometimes kind of 
um, sort of crude compared to how he would finesse other areas. But I think he was much more interested in putting a figure in a landscape just to suggest scale, such as the piece I'm going to demo. The figures are just little kind of tiny little figures on horseback, so it kind of shows you the scale of the scene, which is, which is a good way to establish scale in a scene. Um, so in his book, I would say he's probably most known for the, um, the way he kind of breaks down rhythms and compositions. And so we have all these really great little tiny rectangles. And I remember the, f the first time like opening this book and seeing all these little rectangles and just the little pencil lines. And they're just so, they almost have like an, um, a woodcut appearance to them. And, and I was really attracted to them. And so I went about finding um, photo reference that kind of matched some of the compositions and then doing paintings to, to understand composition. They were little tiny pieces. Um, and that's how I, I kind of studied him in the beginning. Um, so he has these like s selecting an image and, and how you compose it. And then he has a bunch of um, actual specific compositions like circular or triangular, three spot. Um, he's got, let's see here, more triangular, you know, steel yards group masses, and a lot, he does a lot of circular, some S-curve, quite a few little S-curves up in here. I would say most artists tend to go with S or um, kind of a zigzag composition when you look at paintings. Um, not as many do circular, but he did a lot of circular, and, I, and, and the piece I picked kind of has a bit of that um, in, in the composition. So he kind of talks about steel yard, balance scales, circular, S or compound curve. Um, pyramid or triangle, cross, radiating line, like if you had a sunset coming through the clouds, an L or rectangular. So he gives examples of all of them, suspended steel yard, three spot. So if you're kind of looking for uh, oh, diagonal line, tunnel, silhouette, and pattern. Pattern's a tough one. That's like pretty busy. It's like looking at a puzzle. Um, so if you, if you have some of your own landscape photos and you want to know how to simplify them or or break them down, or you, or you like to do plain air paintings, um, this would be a great little study guide to, to even bring with you if you want to kind of scan what you're looking at and try to break it down into something uh, more simplified. Um, as a matter of fact, the piece I picked, eh, the composition is not overly clear. It has a bit of um, circular with a bit of um, kind of a, um, a zigzag. So. It's not as obvious. And Eric even commented, no, I'm not really wild about that composition. And I said, I just want to paint clouds. So that was kind of my two cents on that. Um, so before I even started breaking down the image, I wanted to do a little bit of um, breaking down his image before I wanted to put it on the canvas. So I kind of broke down what I thought was happening with the with the composition, sort of a circular and, a, and then a zigzag. I mean, anytime you put figures into a piece, they will become a pretty strong focal point. And the clouds in this piece come down and around and, and point you down towards the figures. Um, and then it hits that ground plane, which kind of shoots off like in a bit of a zigzag. So we kind of have this rhythm happening here with strong diagonals and um, some horizontals. And he talks a bit in there about presenting a painting um, how horizontals present sort of um, peacefulness in an image, whereas the verticals make it exciting. Um, so that's kind of something to think about how you're interrupting these horizontal sleepy planes with the more awake or exciting um, vertical planes. Um, and then in here I did a, uh, a value range sketch and so I used markers. And so you can get like marker sets that come in just grays. Um, so if you want to get better at um, kind of planning out your your landscapes or any pieces in general, like any anything you paint, you can break them down into simple values. Um, typically something in a four value range. I ended up using five on my sketch because of the clouds being um, pretty, there's a lot of variation in the values there to get them to, to, um, to read against the blue sky. Um, but typically you can just pick four values and so if you look at your image and say it's a pretty dark image like a, like more along the 
the lines of a nocturne. You might pick like a, a 9, a 10, a 7, and maybe a 6, or maybe a 5, you know, something like a 5. And so that might be what you grab out of your marker pile and try to push things into the value you find closest to this. So it forces you to um, just kind of look at something uh, in a big picture scale and not look at little tiny, like very specific values. Um, and then when you're planning out your colors, you want to make sure that you have maybe, you might have color changes occurring, but you don't really shift values very much. So if something fits into a three value, you want to try to keep it in, in that value range. And then if you're doing a piece that's more in the middle range, you might pick like a two, four, five, and a, an eight, you know, something like that. Um, something where you have a couple steps in between each one, and that will help you kind of get through. Now, if it was just me without an understanding of, of the values, I would be using all the markers. Uh, and that's just the, the way um, my brain works. It just tends to look at things very piecemeal and like really focus on these little, little things. So doing an exercise like this, it's kind of torture for me. Um, but I also think it's really, really helpful and necessary because I tend to not be big picture. I don't tend to see the big picture. I see little details. And when you just add up a bunch of details, you don't make a good image. It, it just looks like puzzle pieces. It's not, not very coherent. So to have um, this to preface your, your big piece, all these steps in the process will really aid you, especially when you hit a rough patch. Um, you can go back and look at your sketch and say, oh, that should fall into a different value or temperature or, yeah, I'm getting too piecemeal with things or no, I don't want to use any dark darks for this because that's not in my value range. And it also gives you freedom to transform your reference or the scene in front of you. Um, you don't have to necessarily paint what you see. You can push things into one direction or other if it makes a better composition. And most of the time that's how good paintings work. They're not um, literal. They tend to be trans transformed. Um, so yeah, these are a good little tool. These are Copic. They're double-ended. double, double -ended. They're ridiculously expensive, I think, and they tend to dry out on you quickly. So if you, you know, like this set was about 50 bucks. And so I, I want to make sure I use these up before they, they dry out, because I've heard they dry out quickly. Uh, but there's Prismacolor sets, and then there's um, kind of knockoffs out there. So if you are kind of testing the waters out for, for investing in these things, get an inexpensive set and um, just see if you, if you like working in that way. You could always use a, a pencil or charcoal, something like that. You don't have to use markers. I just find with the markers, it's like preset, ready to go, and so I don't have temptation to have variation in there, which is something that I tend to do. So again, I'm trying to do things to help kind of um, tie my hands behind my back in a way or handicap myself to a certain degree. Um, and so I'm going to give you several choices. Again, he can paint very, very complicated all the way down to very simple. You might choose to pick a section of a painting or you might choose to pick something more elaborate. Um, but you also might find your own reference of Edgar Payne's work. And that's another good thing about studying him. There's a lot of good reference of him um, online. So I'll, I'll give some submissions of some different varieties of landscapes. But if none of those really suit you or, or, or speak to you, then pick something, pick something else. And he has a huge range of subjects. So you could anything from boats to, to landscapes or um, to to seascapes, boats, all the way to southwest, to big, huge, epic peaks, to kind of um, more English scenes. He's got all of it. So there's, there's something in there that hopefully you'll like. Um, and then what I did next was I did a gouache, a little uh, gouache comp. And um, so this was just another step in that process um, of how he works. And so I kind of laid in the gouache the way he goes about his um, oil painting uh, process. In, in the book, he kind of talks a little bit that he also treats gouache the way he does oil paint, and he felt like that is maybe a little different than art, other artists. They, they might use 
opaque watercolor more traditionally, whereas he kind of uses it like oil paint. So he kind of does an underpainting wash like he does his oil paintings and then works pretty opaquely on top. So that's kind of how I went about doing my little gouache comp. So um, something else that I found interesting is when I printed out my, my image of his, the colors in it look completely different than what's online. It was very purple. Everything was purple, purple, purple. The blues were purple, the clouds were just purple. Um, and just didn't look the same. So I had to go into Photoshop and take the image and lean it more towards yellow and green and blue um, to help adjust it to what I could see online. Um, so I have my iPad today, which is a little bit more true. Um, whereas my printout, even after adjusting it, it's kind of punchy and um, a little bit off. So just be aware that if you look at something in a book versus online versus how you print it out, there can be uh, different variations in, in that. And sometimes you'll see the same image online that looks different. Like um, when I studied uh, Sargent's Lady Agnew painting, you could find like 20 different variations of the color and value range in that piece. Uh, and so you have, to, you have to ask yourself, what does this actually look like? I mean, because it's kind of important when you're studying somebody to kind of get inside their process in their head and to, to kind of pick the things that, you know, make the choices that they make in order to understand what they do. Um, and so I try as much as I can when I look at somebody to, to kind of understand that. And like he picked a specific palette and had a certain way he laid things in. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm going to do that in my own work all the time, unless it's something I find really, really useful. Um, that's how I, I really want to present studying other people. It's not the intention to be a copy of them. It's the intention to add something to your weakness. You know, add, take one of their strengths and try to build your weakness with it. Um, or find a step in their process that you find useful. Um, but I've studied with a lot of people or, or looked at a lot of people's work that I admire, but I don't really want to copy. Um, but I might copy an aspect of what they do to improve something in, in what I do. Um, for instance, <laughs> in his process, he does um, an, an underpainting wash. Uh, it call, he calls for red ochre in his book. Um, it's actually Indian red. And um, I had to look up Indian red to make sure it wasn't just kind of a, a derogatory <laughs> paint name. It's actually sourced from India, um, so that's why it's called Indian Red. And it's actually the world's oldest pigment. I guess they can find examples going back to like 40,000 years. So I have uh, a tube of that. I had a couple tubes of it. Um, in the past, I've tried using this in skin tone, and I don't like it at all. Um, but I, maybe I didn't really understand that it wasn't like a, a term for a skin tone of somebody. It's actually where it's sourced. Uh, it was just kind of confusing. Um, it's a very strange pigment to use um, in skin tone mixtures. You can, but it tends to kind of uh, make things a little kind of chalky or muddy in a way. Um, but anyway, that's what he used to um, tone his, his surface. Um, so he did a wash with that, and for the most part. Um, and that's another thing I, I didn't really understand until I went and saw his work in person. And there's a Joan Irvine Smith Museum up in Irvine, and they typically show quite a few California Impressionist works. Um, and they have permanent collection as well with some Edgar Paynes. And so when I went to look at his work in person, that was something I really liked was that he had um, these, I, specifically the boat paintings. There are a lot of blues in the scene, but then he had all these like little orange compliments kind of coming through in areas that really kind of vibrated against the blues. And so he talks about that in his book that letting some of that come through kind of gives a vibration. It also gives a cohesiveness to things when you have a, an underpainting. So in that sense, that's something I would probably um, employ in my own work, especially in a scene that's a, an orange and blue compliment scheme to begin with. I, I would probably do kind of a, 
um, an orangey brown underpainting to help unify everything. He talked about also, um, and you should have this book, just get this book, it's a really good book. There's another one I ordered that uh, didn't come in time, of course. Um, it's, a, it's more about just his paintings, but this is, a, this is just a great book and everyone should have this in their library. Uh, but he talks about the idea of um, the soup method where you kind of mix a large puddle of a color that you're going to inject into all your colors. So if you if say your scene has a lot of yellow green dominance, you might mix up a big pile of yellow green and then that gets mixed into all your, your colors. So even the whites have a bit of yellow green, even the reds do, and so everything will kind of unite together in the painting. It's a kind of the idea that your light source has a certain color and so that's prevalent in, in the scene, you know, especially, you know, like something like a sunset where you have a really, really strong, saturated light source and that's going to kind of permeate everything. And he says even in a scene when something is really colorful, that in theory should be um, interacting and spreading out that color in all the vicinity around that particular color. Um, which is something I, I do agree, I agree with that as well. Um, so I, I wrote some, some little notes here. Um, so the first thing he kind of talks about is knowledge must precede ex execution. So knowledge, you know, you need to have uh, some skill or some understanding of something before you go out and execute it. And that just seems so that just seems like common sense like well yeah totally like you need to know how to break something down in order to to reconstruct it in a painting um but it, it's a good it's just a good thing to think about that i need to go and, and gather some knowledge for some tools before i try to build yeah i need my tools in order to build something you know um so as far as like a little bit of advice on palette and things like that um he says, use fewer colors for more control, which makes sense. Um, and if you are um, inclined to go out and do plein air, having a scaled down palette is really smart because that is, it's just easier to transport and to execute and you don't feel like you're wasting anything. Um, especially if you go out to go plein air painting and you get like an hour window for something, you don't want to have to put out 25 things. Um, now he says to, it's kind of funny, he says avoid siennas and umbers and drab shades. And I don't know if that's just advice he gives based on him kind of falling into that sort of impressionist realm where, you know, the impressionists kind of came along and they were like, don't use black, don't use earth colors, mix all your colors from, you know, saturated pigments. That was sort of more their philosophy. Um, and so he kind of advises essentially a bit of like a warm and cool primary palette um, for that time period where he advises using, let's see here, he's got, you know, cad lemon and a cad yellow deep or orange. Um, he says light cad red and deep cad red, which is a weird color. I'm just warning you, that's a funky color. I would put that into almost the same category as a, an earth color where it can make things drab. Um, let's see what else. Viridian. Make sure you're using um, real Viridian and not a hue. Um, ultramarine blue and Indian red. White, obviously. So that's the, the palette he essentially gives you in his book. But um, I also researched online and people have said that he, in his paintings, he also used things like Hooker's Green, which is, um, Hooker's Green Genuine is actually not a very light, fast color. So one of the pigments in that mix kind of um, is fugitive. So I don't recommend that. Um, and then modern day Hooker's Green is made with phthalo and like, uh, I think naphthol yellow. So it's like a really pungent yellow green. Um, so if you want to try that on your palette, it's kind of strong, just keep that in mind. Um, he says, or they said that they noticed he had alizarin in his paintings. I don't use alizarin, so I brought another quinacridone. So this is a cool red, which to me is a better red than cad red deep. 
Cat Red Deep's just really weird. Uh, I don't really know how to explain it. In the, in the sense that it's actually one of those colors where when it comes out of the tube, I really like it because it's just this unusual, cool, rich kind of a cherry red. But when you mix it into other things, it looks weird. It kind of goes purple. So it's just, I don't know what it is. Whereas, you know, like regular Cad Red, the from light to medium, it's really like vibrant. Um, and this one's kind of funky. So I don't know, maybe I'll try it a little bit today. Um, he had Van Dyke Brown, which I don't have. It's kind of a very dull pigment talking about drab. Um, and Payne's Gray. And I don't think Payne's Gray is named after him. Um, but Payne's Gray tends to be a very blue kind of gray. Um, it looks like black when you squeeze it out, but it looks it, it ends up looking kind of really blue in your mixtures. Um, and so he doesn't have any black on his palette or anything like that. So just as a, a, a minimum palette for an Edgar Payne painting, you'd want some sort of a warm and cool primary palette. Um, you, could, you could have, um, instead of Radiant, if you wanted to use Thalo, you could. Um, just keep in mind it's a lot more potent than Viridian. So that's what I like about Viridian. It's pretty, um, pretty controlled. And then in the book, he also says, try many palettes. <laughs> um, and I agree with that. Like he, he made reference that, you know, you might have different palettes for different scenes, but also, um, getting a kinship with your palette. And so, um, finding the palette that works best for you, something that's like the back of your hand, you just, you just know what it can do for you and you can utilize it. Um, and so uh, an artist that's in today's day and age who was heavily influenced by Edgar Payne is Scott Christensen. And originally Scott was using a palette with um, just four colors on it, a white, a yellow, a red, and a blue. And that's what he used for everything. And then he kind of came up with um, a line of these grays that are mixed from the three primaries um, because he got um, kind of a partnership with Vasari Paint. And so they manufacture some premixed colors for him. And so what he'll do is he'll put out a big puddle of that um, soup color. So maybe he'll pick like a blue gray and he puts out a big puddle of that. And then he'll mix that into all his, his three primaries as part of a way to kind of key his whole palette. So he's kind of taking Edgar Payne's approach and just um, making some convenience colors out of it. And you could do the same thing. You could mix up a puddle of something that you put into all your um, mixtures and you could use a palette that's just a white, a yellow, a red, and a, and a blue. Or maybe you want to take a, um, no, nah, that's a weird red. I'd probably go with this one because these two can make kind of a pretty warm red. Um, whereas this mixed with that cat lemon, ugh, that is not a good color. Uh, in my opinion. But yeah, you could have something like this as part of your, your plein air kit, and then maybe you have a, a big puddle of premix something that you, you put into it. Um, I watched Jeremy Lipking demo, and he had that same thing, where he had his set palette, and then he had this big puddle of like lavender colored paint. And that's something I've noticed about a, a lot of his paintings. They tend to look like they have a lavender sort of light source. So he's using this middle value puddle with all of his mixtures. So it kind of adds harmony to everything and tempers everything, but it also gives it a key in a certain range. So it's kind of a, a cool concept to think about, you know, having a, a puddle, something that you, you mix. Um, so again, yeah, he says, try many palettes. So maybe you want to try something really strange. Maybe you do, uh, you know, like a Payne's gray and an Indian red and a lemon and a white. And that would be a very like, um, more neutral, like more, almost like along the lines of a Zorn palette in a way. Um, you wouldn't get super vibrant colors out of it, but you also wouldn't get anything that would be overly saturated. So I just like the idea of um, having uh, like some kind of restraints in your palette, but then taking that particular little set and maximizing it. So like, what can you get out of it? Like when I look at Scott Christensen's work, I actually think, God, it, it seems so colorful. Um, like, but like really balanced, not like, oh, just color for the sake of color. But I never look at it and think, wow, he's using a really limited palette and it's kind of drab. I never think that. Um, so that's another person to, to take a look at. Um, so some other little pointers, like just sort of his process. I'll talk about that now. 
he says, you know, do drawings in a sketchbook of your potential subjects. And that's just pretty common sense. Almost every artist recommends that. So maybe you have a, a piece of um, landscape reference and you maybe want to take that and do some different sketches of that exact reference. Maybe some where you kind of zoom in or zoom out or move some things around. So kind of explore how to make the most out of that piece of reference. <clears throat> and then he goes in and he does, when he starts to decide to commit to one of his sketches, then he has his, <clears throat> his canvas, excuse me. I picked something kind of, kind of toothier today because, um, Typically, landscape painters um, use a little bit more of a toothy. That's why you have, you know, canvas and then you have portrait grade. So portrait grade tends to be really, really fine and slick. And I wanted something with a little more tooth because he's not a, um, he's not like a nitpicky painter. He's not going to go in there and like, he's just, he's, he's got big, bold brushwork and that's kind of more the, the canvas for it. So he tones his canvas and then he takes charcoal and he, establishes his pattern um, and does some some darks now that's an approach I would never use for myself <laughs> and so I'll just say right there I, I don't want to I don't like doing it and I hate looking at this right now it kind of like bothers me to, to look at this sloppy mess um, but I was trying my best to think like him and, and do what he does. And so he would kind of put some cross hatching through areas where he either wanted rhythms or wanted to make that dark. Um, I use vine charcoal. So if you're gonna sketch it in with charcoal, try vine charcoal. Um, when you put down vine charcoal, it looks really dark, but it kind of comes off pretty easily, which is why it's not something good for doing nice drawings with because it's just so um, impermanent. It just kind of blows away when you look at it. But for this, all I know is when I go to put in things on top of it, that charcoal is going to keep coming through and, and mixing in and making everything gray. Um, so uh, I'm not real excited about that uh, part of the process. I like to use mechanical pencil on my own lands. So that's just uh, something where I'm, I'm doing it for the sake of the, of the project. And I do think it's a good idea to try to do something as exact as, they, as you can if you have the principles in front of you of how they work. Um, and just so you kind of get a real feel for it. Um, and again, I might walk away and take a little like 10% of what they do with me, not all of it. Um, <clears throat> and then working all over the canvas, he uses thin paints to establish um, his color scheme. Um, and he starts to apply thicker pigment to the darks. And he typically would work from dark to light. Not always, but somewhat. This is just what the book says. <laughs> um, and then he would uh, employ the soup method, you know, where he would have a big puddle of something that he would kind of mix in into everything. I was trying to look at my reference and see maybe purple gray is kind of part of everything. Um, so that's, that could be, I mean, if I look at the clouds, they're almost as sort of a, bit of a gray purple to them and then in the blue sky there's sort of a greenish gray on there um, so nothing is really super super potent um, saturated color at all uh, so he's got something that's in his mixtures that's permeating everything um, and then he and then he would let little hints of the underlying ochre tone come through um, giving his the vibrancy to things um, so then the next thing when you decide on your piece is you want to pick your scale or your size canvas to reflect the same scale of his piece. Unless, of course, you want to pick a section, say you take an 8x10 out of it and just do it on 8x10. Um, this particular piece is 33 inches by 37 inches. That is not a standard size. Um, <laughs> I think in the old days it didn't really matter because you, you always had to have custom framing anyway. So it's kind of nice, I guess, as an artist, you could just, you know, pick whatever best was, you know, like sometimes I'll have an image and it's like, it doesn't really fit into a two to three ratio or a three to four ratio. It's not really, it just doesn't really fit into any of those ratios, but then I have to kind of force it. So I might have to bring something into the scene just because I want to use standard size framing. Um, because it's a lot less expensive than custom uh, framing. Uh, but I think it's kind of cool back then you could pick 
something that was almost square, but not quite. Um, so this is a 33 by 37. And so I did my ratio on it. And I've done this before, talking about these ratios, of how to pick your size. And I always kind of screw up the math on it. But in, 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 anyway, you look, look at your image size that you are presented with. Say something's a 44 by 50 or something like that. And you put your, your size, so mine was 33 over 37. So that's your ratio, um, the short over the larger. And then I, put, I like to put in my known measurement of the largest maximum size of my canvas. So say I have a um, 12 by 16 canvas at home. Well, if I put in um, the largest size here as 16, and then I end up with a ratio above it at 14.3, which is what it is, it's not going to fit on a 12 by 16. So I'm actually going to have to put in the maximum size would be 12. So you want to put your maximum size in um, on the bottom. So in the case here, I went down in the garage and I had this 16 by, oddly enough, a 16 by 15 inch panel. And I was like, hey, that's great. Um, so I have 16 in there in my, my bottom measurement because that's the biggest measurement on my panel. Um, and what you'll do is you multiply the small or the, the lower measurement by the top measurement. So you have your small uh, measurement on your known size by your um, measurement on your, on your unknown. So you, you multiply 33 times 16 and then you divide that by 37. And in my case, it ended up being like 14 by three, six, I think. So I cut out a 14.3 inch um, image on this size, on, on this um, piece. And so now I know mine's the exact same scale as his painting, even though it's funny because every time I look at his painting, it looks longer um, than mine but I measured it like several times to make sure. So again, um, say he's doing, like just for simple math, if he's doing a 20 by 40, and you know you have a, a, a 10 inch panel, then, you, then you'd have 320 times, or 200, sorry, 20 times 10, and then you divide that by 40. So anything you, you do, you want to make sure your scale is comparable to, to what he's, he's working on. And you could always take, like, say you had a 16 by 20 or, uh, again, that 12 by 16 where you had to put your 12 on the, on the bottom and say it's like 10.6 uh, is the upper measurement. You could always tape off the parts you don't need just so you know you're working within the same proportion. And the reason I talk about the, you know, making sure your proportions are the same is because I put in a little cross grid on my um, canvas and on my, my reference. So that way I'm making sure I'm putting the same information in here and here. So if you don't have a projector at home, normally when we do the painting from master's class, everybody goes in and projects their image out. And so that way they know they have the exact same image. Um, but I also know back in this time period, they didn't have projectors per se. I mean, yeah, they had camera obscuras, but artists just didn't really use those back then. Most of the time they did gridding. Um, and, and so it's just something I always like to advise people to learn how to do. Um, it's really simple and you can do it anywhere. Um, you don't need a machine or a tool. You just need a calculator to figure out your proportions. And so I know that whatever fits in this X is the same as what's in here. And, and I did pretty simple a pretty simple breakdown. Really just the little figures are the only real complicated thing about this scene. Um, but you know, I want to make sure that I have my clouds where they're supposed to be and so on and so forth. So that's kind of what you'll want to do. Um, and for this, probably this first, um, first session, try to, to do all this prep work and get that all ready to go. Because this class is going to go by very quickly. So I would probably try to pick something either that you're willing to kind of commit to working on for more than just the class term um, or pick something smaller that you feel like you can execute fairly quickly, keeping in mind that 
part of this particular lesson is in, in the prep work. So I'm just trying to teach you a little bit about the preparation process. All right, so now I'm going to lay out the, the palette. So I'm going to get my paints ready to go here. So I'm putting out, I probably need a lot of titanium because of clouds. I always like to lay out my palette as sequentially as possible. So I like to go from the, the warms to the cools, typically. And I'm going to try using the Cad Red Deep, even though it's a weirdo color. So yeah, you look at it and you go, wow, that's a great color. I might just, I might just show you how it defers. So I will put out some of this ruby red, which is a quinacridone red, essentially. You know, or a permanent rose, you could use that, or a lizard. Um, you can see how they're both very cool reds compared to the cad red, but they don't work the same. Uh, let's see. It's so ultramarine. Probably need more than that because of the sky. Iridian. And then some of this Indian red. And I think a lot of times he used Indian red mixed with um, ultramarine to make a, a really good dark. So I don't think I'll even use Payne's gray today. I don't have hooker's green, so I don't, I'm not going to use that either <laughs> since I don't have it. Um, so let's just see if I can just talk about this, why I keep talking about cad red being weird. So it kind of makes this strange, uh, to me it's strange, a strange color. You can see it's kind of, um, it's a pretty red. It's just sort of um, gray for a red. Now, which is probably fine for this, for this scene. Now when I use the ruby red, You can already see, just. So why would you want to pick a more vibrant red? Well, if you really were going to scale your palette down to just as little as possible, having um, the most clean pigment, you know, quote unquote, you know, desaturated or clean pigment would be ideal. It's more along the lines of thinking like a CMYK, where a red like this, this red here, if I was to mix a cool, lemon in there, I can get a pretty decent orange out of that. I mean, it's not going to be the same as a cat orange, but it definitely has a good, you know, rich orange color. The other red, on the other hand, yeah, it's just weird. I don't dislike it, and I think it'd be f I could use it on the cliffs, um, which is what I'll probably do today, uh, just to be trying to experiment as much as possible. But I'm just, you just can see, I'm just pointing this out, that it looks a certain way, but then when it plays with the other pigments, it's, it's um, not what you expect. It's kind of a, a wolf in sheep's clothing in a way. Um, and, and there's a lot of pigments like that, you know, even like the Indian red, you think it's this rich kind of reddish brown. And then once you get lighter pigments in there, it kind of goes real cold. Um, same with burnt umber. I don't like burnt umber for that reason. It's this beautiful warm brown and then you add white and it turns gray. It's the weirdest thing. Um, and technically anytime you add white to something, it cools things off and it grays it out. But you know, like this, I get a good kind of really saturated hot pink that I can choose to desaturate. But if I need something that's, that represents something almost hot pink in my painting, then I want to have the option. So I want it as clean as possible. So again, if you wanted to go out in the field, like if I wanted like the most like neutral saturated palette, I would pick Cad Lemon 
um, a quinacridone red, such as this ruby red, and then I would probably pick cobalt blue and white, and I could get the most intense pigments out of that. I'd have to do a lot more work to desaturate, but they would allow me to get really uh, intense pigments from it. So anyway, let me just get rid of that because that was just my argument with the palette. Now back in, the, in that time period that, that Edgar Payne worked, I don't believe they had quinacridones yet until probably after the, well, I mean, technically aniline dyes came into the uh, late 19th century, so they might have had quinacridones, but I don't think they were really something that were seen a lot in paintings until after the turn of the century. And in that time period, they also used what's called rose matter, which kind of looks like permanent rose, but it's not permanent. It's very um, fugitive. So that's probably why he recommended the Cad Red Deep, because it's a cooler red and it's very permanent. Um, it's just a weird red. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, but anyway, so I want to kind of go about his process of, of laying in some thin, some thin washes to, to get started. Yeah. So let's do that. So I think you just use these stains. Now again, I kind of look and I see the blue cloud area is having kind of a, a greener blue wash on top of it. Um, it's like a real, almost like a cerulean sort of look. So I'm gonna use more of a blue leaning blue in the beginning. And that way I'm gonna put that other wash on top. Now this is probably a little saturated. So I'm gonna put the, he advises, just like I do, using a complement to the saturate your pigments rather than using um, a, a shade or, you know, which is essentially black and white, you know, a gray, a gray, a neutral gray. He recommends complements. Uh, so I'll put a little, little red in there just to take that down a notch. <clears throat> 